Welcome everyone to theCUBE here in Palo Alto, California. I'm John Furrier, host of theCUBE with Dave Vellante, my co-host. We're here for the Silicon Valley AI Infrastructure Leaders Program, part of theCUBE plus NYC Wired Communities. Alex Caligos here, founder and CEO of Red Panda Data. Alex, great to see you, thanks for coming in. Thank you for having me. So this is a series about infrastructure and hardware, it's changing, a lot of action going on there. When this is, it's moving very fast. Um, and the next layer is data, mm -hmm. that's going to flip and that's going to change too. So right now all the performance is in the hardware, but there's a lot of going on in between hardware and data is what you guys do. Take a minute to explain what you guys do, your mission, why you were founded and where you guys are at. I would start with um, my thoughts on the future of infrastructure. And I'll start by saying that the future is not going to be built in batch, it's going to be built in real time. And so what the company and what Red Panda is, is we are a complete end-to-end uh, -end streaming platform. And so uh, we power some of the world's largest banks, some of the world's largest content delivery networks. Uh, and so some of our customers are companies like Akamai, the largest ISP in Europe, you know, large electric car companies and so on. Those tend to be our customers. And I think there's really two major trends for that. Uh, one is basically the movement away from batch into streaming, and then the other tailwind is AI, which I'm sure we're going to get yeah. into. But for those listening in, we, um, you know, we we are an end-to-end -end platform for processing data really fast, and that's what people want. Real time is what all the apps want. Now, generative AI now is a category as Jensen Wang and Visa. It's a new category. It's generative, it's not programmed. It's kind of runtime in a way. So data is important, but the infrastructure has got to deliver as well. What's your feeling around that trend and how is that changing how people look at their enterprise? I think our view is a little bit contrarian to the common wisdom today. And so um, the insight here is that the world wants to uh, build this transformative user experiences with Gen AI, but they don't want to share their data uh, with, with model companies, right? So with like OpenAI or Anthropic or Mistral, it's just too sensitive, at least for the enterprise and for the customers that, that we, we get to talk to. Uh, two, they don't, they don't trust the execution. You're like, okay, well, what, like, what output, like how, how did we get here? What is the trace? What is the source data that generated that? Um, and three, they don't really know how to protect it well. Right? And so the, the idea that the world is going to be about sending data to the model, I don't think that's the future for the enterprise. I think the inverse is going to be true, where you can send the model to the data. And so that, that's our view on it, especially as you think about building these real-time interactive experiences. Right? It would be um, absurd to think that uh, your credit card would allow a Nigerian Prince transaction to buy an Apple computer. Like you just don't even expect that to be a case anymore. You want to transact and you expect that to be marked as fraud like right there at the time of transaction with the point of sales. And so that's how we see uh, AI, especially for streaming, is the model being shipped to the data. Beyond cost efficiency, it's actually about the sovereignty and the governance of like, okay, well, what has access to what model? How do we trace it and how do we protect it? But you can just, I mean, today, you can, you can pretty much detect that fraud in, in real time. Very narrow use case, you got the historical analytic systems that might have been bad, but then you've got that model that's right there today. But you're talking about, I think, much more sophisticated, intelligent, data app supporting intelligent mm -hmm. data applications, sort of this new breed, is that, is that right? And can you sort of give us a sense as to what those look like? Yeah, so I think that the, uh, <clears throat> the classic, if, if we go with the fraud detection use case as an yep. example. Fraud detection, as I explained it with a credit card fraud, mm -hmm. is relatively easy because the signals are well defined. Well, if you live in San Francisco, and you're getting a transaction from a different nope. geolocation, like super, right? the signals are rather yep. uh, easy. This is really difficult for other domains. Mm -hmm. And so that was sort of a, uh, a proxy of example, but in gaming, as an example with some, so we power some of the world's largest gaming engines, right? And there is this really difficult problem that they solve, which is the idea of exploiting and selling the loot of games, right? And so you have mm -hmm. these uh, bots that go and farm the games, and then they have to go and try and back and sell the loot back to other players. And so that is much more complicated. It's a, it's a much more dynamic system with, and so the idea of marketing, hey, is this a bot? Is this a real player? Do we need to flag this as fraud? That actually cost them millions and millions and millions of dollars. And so this, I think where we'll see the uh, 
taking a Llama 3, a Mistral, right, sort of this like state-of-the-art open source models being shipped uh, to the enterprises for this more dynamic world where the signals are not so clear cut. It's not so like, okay, geolocation, super easy. Uh, you know, your credit card is above $3,000, super easy to mark these high value transactions. Uh, but I think in a more machine-to-machine -machine setting, those kind of use cases are much more difficult to process. So guys, bring up the power law if you could, because I, I, I want to ask Alex a, qu a question on this. So the idea here is you've got a classical power law, the, the size of model is on the vertical axis, the model specificity is, is on the horizontal axis, and then in the middle, in that red torso, you've got that pulling up to the right. This was really John Furrier's, frankly, innovation. Is You've got all that open source pulling up, just what you said. You got Llama, you got Mistral, you got e even third parties like Anthropic pulling up that torso, okay, and sort of semi-democratizing that. My question is, when you think about the sovereign AI, which would be on that long tail, yes. we've kind of implied that it's smaller models, but maybe that's not necessarily the case. Maybe there's some big honking models on that. That's why there's a little hump up in the, yeah. in the curve. <laughs> but I'm wondering what you're seeing. Uh, you're probably seeing a, a lot of action on small language models, but, but are you also seeing some rather large language models being applied in that domain specificity? Yeah, definitely. I so it's 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 a, it's a set of trade-offs, right? And I think the way that the CTOs are thinking through this is latency. How fast am I going to get a response from it? And so the larger models uh, are slower. And so the only two techniques is you go lower in terms of the size of the parameter input, and then the only other technique is the quantization, right? And so you can take like a very high fidelity model, 32-bit floating point into let's say a bit floating point. And so that, those are the main two techniques today to be able to give like super fast responses. Blackwell. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. And so, so that's one. Um, I think, you know, just as a side note, which I think is just as important, is that there is no real breakout model today. Llama 405 billion is roughly in the same category as, as OpenAI GPT-4.0 yep. and Claude, you know, Sonnet 3.5 by Anthropic. And so I think those, those are like real, the real pull for the enterprise. They're like, hey, Maybe I would incur the risk of sending my data to these foundation models if those models would be an order of magnitude better, but they aren't right now in the enterprise. And so what we're seeing is a bunch of innovation actually pulling up, like you mentioned, the, the belly of, of, of the models in that you, and you know, a llama uh, 3.1 7 billion parameter model, when you fine tune it, you get a state of the art performance with not a lot of hardware, right? We're talking about 16 gigabytes of, of, of GPU, and just hardware is so damn good today. Yeah. Like, you know, I think you can really push this to the edge and, and that's what we're seeing. And the enterprise see data as a proprietary asset, intellectual property. They're not going to just give it away. They're going to build their own models and then integrate in. You see that happening through uh, APIs. Are the models going to have a special mechanism? How does the interaction happen between models? So I think where, I think the world has, has sort of thought that uh, open source developer get together in a room and they're like, we're going to create an API and then the world is going to adopt it. That's not the case. Actually, adoption yields this specification. In other words, when OpenAI came up with this HTTP interface, all of the other open source runtimes, they're like, well, we're just going to make it compatible with this, this HTTP API. And so what's nice in terms of the ecosystem and how the, the, the CISOs and CTOs are thinking through this, they're like, as long as my application can speak yeah. the same protocol, as open AI, then you can just ship the execution of the model to VLLM, you can ship the execution of the model to Olama and to all of these other providers. And so at the detail, it's actually the same language that you use to speak with open AI, but in terms of the execution yeah. of it, it is now happening local host, right next to the data, and the data is not leaving the network. Yeah. I had, as an anecdote, I was doing a road show in New York a couple of weeks ago and I talked to one of the market makers, right? There's only seven of them in the <laughs> world. Think trillion dollar level liquidity for the world. And the CTO of this hedge fund said, I will never send my data to OpenAI. To, that's my alpha, that's the business. Yeah. Like my entire business model is to figure out which are the signals that are going to tell me what to trade or what not to trade. And so people think that this is anomaly but then you go on, you talk to the largest drug manufacturing company, and they're like, I just spent $6 billion developing this new thing, you know, this yeah. new drug. Like, that's never living my five layers of network security, yeah. right? And so that's more the case 
than the exception. I think in the SMB market, perhaps people have different security requirements. It's interesting. Then. You're bringing up basically what private AI, now your sovereign AI is talking about, data is the IP, securities in many, you're talking about the platform. So I want to get your thoughts on this because the data business has been, if you're, I'm a data guy, uh, has been like, oh, you're a database person. You're a DBA or hey, you do analytics, you do dashboards. Okay, that's not going away, but now all the actions around platform engineering, right? DevSecOps folks are getting involved. So a lot of the architect work is being done, I'm sure at these banks around resetting the foundation of their infrastructure to handle distributed computing at scale. Mm -hmm. And now we throw Gen AI in the mix, the data's got to be horizontally scalable, yeah. but yet specialized at any given moment. Yeah. Now that is not what was around a few years ago. This is a big sea change. There is a big sea change in uh, the requirements, but also in the skills. And something that I started hearing from our customers recently, it's like, it's almost like the merging of the data science with the infrastructure roles. I'm not sure how, just because like the world is so complicated as it is, and you're just like, well, I want a unicorn, and that's really difficult to get, right? And so, yeah, yeah. but from an engineer, I think what's what's nice is that at the infrastructure, you're going, you're seeing this coalescing of technologies into open formats. So Apache Iceberg jumps at me yeah. as a as a format that is unifying, right? Microsoft just announced support for it in Microsoft yeah. Fabric. Databricks just spent a couple billion dollars on acquire a company that was, you know, designed about uh, Apache Iceberg support. Uh, Snowflake embracing it. Yeah, yeah, it's a sort of the world. It's one, it's one. Iceberg is one. The open table format. So let's it, agree. Exactly. Yeah. And so I think. Booty's like, like very specialized. Yeah. And even Delta is, Delta, is yeah. Iceberg. We agree. Yeah. Yeah. It's got the function. Iceberg. It's a, the, the, that's. It looks like they're going to win that. Uh, yeah, right? exactly. Yeah. And it may, you know, I, I think I, I spoke with one of the founders of the internet uh, uh, a few years ago, and he's like, it wasn't that TCP was necessarily the best protocol. It was just the the, the most well adopted protocol, and that's what made the world work. I think similarly with yeah. with Iceberg. I don't know if it's necessarily the best format specification, but the idea that everyone else is going to support it, if yeah. you know, if you're a CI, you're like, well, I want the thing that is going to be interoperable with all of this tooling with my real-time systems like Red Panda or my query engines with a snowflake and so on. And it also gives them uh, a business muscle to exercise like, well, who's going to give me the best price performance? So in the data stack, you're in the data pipeline? Is yeah. that kind of where you are? Yeah, I would say we're like ring zero. That's what I call. And so we are, so at a abstract level, we are an immutable log. And so you can write events in real time, and but you can't change it. And that immutability is really freeing for the architect because uh, you, know, you get to move away from uh, simply being able to derive insights from aggregate like uh, point in time queries like databases. You can start to make decisions on every single data item and you get auditing, you get tracing, you get a huge host of architectural freedoms that would be other otherwise very difficult to achieve. Okay, so we got batch moving to real time. We're bringing the model to the, data. to the data. But data, by its very nature, Alex, is a distributed. So, uh, and the vision we often use is Uber for, for everybody. You've got, you know, Uber's got this distributed system, but they bring it all together, they harmonize the data, <clears throat> and then the outcome is amazing in near real time. Um, how do you fit into all those distributed data elements? Yeah, so if we were to take, if I were to build an Uber today, right, and so, um, Uber is actually built with a, a similarly open source uh, project called Kafka today. Mm -hmm. So this is like very real to how the world is built today. When you see the car moving left to right on your screen, which you know originally I thought it would give me less anxiety, but it's more because they always make the wrong turn. <laughs> yeah, you're yeah, looking at the app. <laughs> yeah, it's like no, that wasn't right. Uh, it, that movement. Uh, it's powered by this project uh, called Kafka. Kafka yeah. And then Red Panda plays in that ecosystem. The listeners can think of Red, of Red Panda as a drop-in replacement for the Kafka ecosystem. Which is very complicated. Yeah, yeah. exactly. It's, it's hard to Kafka's use. Kafka's Kafka's Kafka. Kafka, Kafka not, yeah. not dropping it in. It, yeah. <laughs> or is it, what, what's it take to drop it in? Yeah, well, it's a great question. And so if, if you look at the uh, uh, portfolio of customers that we have and, and the partnerships that we have, they tend to be with the Fortune 5000. So where Red Panda, I think, tends to uh, drive the most value for customers is like the more complicated, effectively, the more or the more data, the more value we can show for customers. Um, from an application perspective, code, 
we haven't had in five years a single customer that has touched a single line of code. And so that is different from yeah. the other promises of other databases. Yeah. Like, frankly, without that, we wouldn't have a business. I had the CTO of Safin, his name is Shahir Dyer, who was an IBM fellow. He didn't believe me, and so he was, before he became the CTO of Safin, which powers some of the world's largest banks, he's like, I don't believe you, first call. Uh, second call is like, I want everyone to turn off uh, you, the, the Kafka computers because they're like, the apps must be configured incorrectly. And then he ran the same workload, and his mind was just blown. blown <laughs> and he's now one of our best advocates. It's just like, um, and so to date, no one has had to touch a single line of code. And so on the drop-in part is if you take the brokers, the back end, so more DevOps, mm -hmm. that's where we tend to partner more deeply. We're like, okay, mm -hmm. well, at some point, the computers have to run different software, right? Like we're a different company. Yeah. And so that, that's the job. The job is you, you change the, the Ansible or Terraform roles, you, you use the software that we give people, but there's no code on the application side. Uh, and that's how we tend to partner with the yeah, world. Nice back-end features. So I got to ask you, so when we did talk to Uber architects, you know, one of their core problems when they actually had to build their first data lake from scratch, because there was no, no concept of a data lake, it really was about, they had different databases. They had Columnar Store over here, SQL over there, and they were going to stream everything, but the costs were outrageous, so they built a data lake. Yep. But there was still streaming use cases where they needed it. So that now is playing out now in real time. We just did that on a super cloud, you know, open data formats, cataloging, and the intelligent data apps are, is all the action. So to get to that intelligent data apps, you need that glue layer, mm -hmm. you need the lake, you need streaming where it's appropriate, yeah. and you need to have multiple databases interacting at the same time. That's essentially the modern version of an Uber. How does that play out today? Where do you fit into that? You forgot transactions, but transactions. we'll add that in too. Okay, like a spanner yeah. in there too, right? Yeah, yeah. Pretty well, well, a lot of databases. Pretty uh, complicated future, but, yeah. but powerful. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's, uh, I think there isn't a better time to be alive in infrastructure engineering, to be honest today. The, the <laughs> things that we could do today, you know, whatever, 20 years ago would be unimaginable. And so to talk about the evolution, I think mentally developers have changed how they reason about a streaming. So a streaming classically has been about this buffer. Like my database can handle the load. This thing that's, is simpler because it doesn't have multi-level indexes and that kind of stuff that databases have. And so I'm going to buffer the data so that it doesn't crash the database or yeah. it doesn't materialize into the columnar data and so on. Well, with the rise of this hyper cloud, high bandwidth object storage systems like S3 or GCS or Azure Blob Store, you can size your cluster as a function of your SLAs. What is the latency and what is the throughput? But the bulk of the data is stored in, in tiered storage format. That's the main shift in architecture. And in fact, that's one of the main reasons why people pay us money is that this, the footprint, the hardware footprint that people have to have in their infrastructure is tiny relative to the amount of data that you yeah. have to store. And so I think- And the yeah. alternative of not having that would be more hardware, more problems. More computers. Just to give you numbers, we've taken, we took a public company in the West Coast from 384 computers down to 24. One use case. We took uh, one of the largest media companies in New York from 150 to 17. Right, literally an order of magnitude improvement because you no longer have to size your cluster. It's like, okay, this computer has a terabyte of disk and then you multiply it right by the replication factor. You're like, well, how fast and how much data? That's the only thing that you size. And when you deploy it in this hyper clouds, whether it's you know, Azure or, or Google or AWS, you sort of offload the data retention problem. And that's, that's the glue. And one of the things too that the, we started the Cube 15 years ago when big data Hadoop was just getting off the ground, and the promise of big data on paper, oh yeah, this could be great, oils, the data's new, oil, all that, that sort of stuff. But it failed because it was harder to configure the clusters and find people to run them was difficult, and the customers weren't yet there full of data, they weren't data fulls, I say. So now you have now the exact opposite. You have more data, so they're full, they're fat with data, and different formats, and the lakes are here, so now you have the innovation. So this is why we see a big pickup in this. Um, what's your reaction to that? The Hadoop problem of skill and complexity, and if, if you believe that clusters can be sized and yeah, personalized, if you will. If you, I, I grew up with, with Hadoop actually maintaining it and running it myself, so I can tell you firsthand. I think what we were- you got a lot of scar tissue there. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. It's always the 3 a.m. pager. Um, the, what people have wanted for a long time, 
was actually sovereignty over their data. And what you gave up in the rise of the hyperclouds is you gave up that operational burden of having to run it yourself, but now you also jailed your data. In other words, in order to query your own data, every time you access it, you have to pay a tremendous amount, right? It's not like you're not just paying for the hardware cost mm -hmm. of S3 and your compute, you're paying for this like, you know, huge value at SaaS software that mm -hmm. comes on top. And what has been limiting to the enterprise up until the open table formats, it's like you want multiple ways of accessing your data. Maybe you want a columnar format because you care about aggregates. And maybe you want a low latency access because you care about your transactional uh, uh, storage engine. And so I think there is a rise, especially over the last three years, this concept of bring your own cloud. This idea that it would have been impossible seven, seven years ago or so, this idea that um, you can offer a fully managed cloud in using someone else's uh, account ID, right? So if you think about the way you architect software for cloud, it's, it's just like, it's a different integer ID. You're like, but the software remains the same. When yeah. you say Terraform deploy. It's just the hardware. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and it's just the cloud API. Like, Amazon it, will it, kill me for saying yeah. that. <laughs> but, it, but it's true, it, it turned a, a, the data center into an API. That's yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah, and yeah. so like now, I think like that, that, that has been the missing yeah. piece. The missing piece is like, I want to own access to my own data. I want the data to be in my own control. Uh, and I want to access it whenever I want with different yeah. products. So you, you, you talked about the hyperscalers and separating the compute from the storage and the value that that brought, that was nice, but it didn't go far enough. Now we're separating any compute now to, from any data. So that's yeah. what Iceberg brings, right? Yeah. So I can bring any engine, your point mm -hmm. about any cloud, basically any engine, Trino, Starburst, Snowflake, Databricks, doesn't matter, to my data, because I'm controlling that data. The problem is governance. Yes. Right? How do I govern that data? Right, because I've got technical data, metadata was the columns and rows, and then I've got business and operational metadata, and role-based access control, and so it's like that governance layer is becoming like security. Right? Exactly. It's a mess. So what are you seeing there? How, how do you guys um, you know, fit in through that maze? I think products will be forced to integrate into open catalogs. Uh, I think you mean like a Unity or yeah, Polaris? Or? Exactly, yeah, you nailed it. I think there's just the discoverability of who owns what table, what data, like what team, when was it last access, is easy when you are a small team and you have, right? So if you think about the, I think organizations ship, uh, not software, but actually the organizational structure. Uh, and so when you're small, you have this N square, everyone knows exactly what's going on with the data. But as the company grows and you have a specialization, um, you lose concept. You, even, if, even if you just look within engineering, like forget about the real business problems. Like you have no idea if that belongs to the dev fraud team or the data team or the, uh, you know, whatever, the engineering team, it's so hard. And so yeah. I think all vendors, us including, we will have to integrate into a catalog of some sort that allows discoverability. What produced this data? Yeah. Somehow. Like At low latency it, too, by the way. Yeah. But and push into that, that catalog. Yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 Okay. Because all these things are dynamic, right? Like if you think about um, let's say a, a cryptocurrency analytic uh, uh, market that we that we power, every time they onboard a new blockchain, it creates a new topic and a new table and like all right, it's not like the data is static. It's not just the 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 underlying attributes are, are are dynamic, right? Like the individual data items are dynamic, but it's also the metadata is dynamic. Yep. How many tables? Who's able to access this? How do you offboard products? How do you onboard products? And so it's it, like everything about it's dynamic. The size of the cluster, how Constantly much it is. changing. Yeah, and yep. so like you just have to be able to figure out like, well, who owns this thing? <laughs> like you know, what does this thing actually do? I have no idea. <laughs> Al, it's been great to have you on the special cube, Silicon Valley leaders. Um, you're doing great work. Uh, obviously, you're on top of it. A lot of people aren't. They're trying to figure it out because it is moving fast, it's like a moving train. Architecture's everything right now. It's both analytics because analytics people know about pipeline. The BI teams, they've been doing data wrangling and all kinds of pipelines. They know that, but they're not the platform engineers. We did a survey, just released it two days ago, that 96% of Gen AI decisions are made by platform teams. Okay, but the business owners see the business model. So it's going to be a collision or an intersection between the business and who makes the call. Because mm -hmm. in the analytics world, that business user and the data science, they made their calls, they yeah. bought, they're buying tools. Yeah. But now the platformization's here and now you got infrastructure under the, under the hood. This is a new paradigm shift for the industry. 
you've kind of pointed out. What should people think about how to architect? Because a lot of people are, are right now looking at, I'm going to build the next decade or plus infrastructure for my company, foundationally. Yeah. No more fashion wars about which version of Kubernetes we're running. Get my Gen A apps up and running. What's my data catalog looking like? What's my open table formats? Where's my intelligent apps? That's the mandate, not what DevOps pipeline we're using. Yeah, I think first, so what's first the advice? principle of thinking, what we see is to move away from uh, request, you know, PRDs and documentation and architects writing to the CTO and the company. We're going to change the entire company. I was like, okay, well, how do you move from that to production? Right, it's actually the enterprise envelope that we have been building for yeah. decades. It is what is the authorization framework, what is the authentication framework, what is the role-based access control, and who has yeah. access to it, and what is the audit log. Like, I think the, the, the models are here. Yeah. You have the Mistral's, the Llamas, and you know the Quen, if you're allowed to deploy Chinese models in your company and all that. Great performance models, state-of-the-art, really quality of answers. And obviously, if you have a business, you have data, and so you have both ends. The challenge is like, is this, is this the enterprise envelope? How do you take this model yeah. and deploy it inside a company where you feel safety? And that comes down to those basic security principles, but also through a new thing, which is the idea of tracing. It's yeah. like, I need to be able to somehow reverse engineer. If you're a credit card company, you want to make sure that you don't have a gender bias, which was the case you know, a few years ago with the major credit card uh, vendor. And you're like, I want to make sure that Alex and his wife get a similar credit rating, right? if they're applying for a similar credit line, if they have the similar, similar finances. And so if you talk to banks, the biggest fear for them is not understanding. Yeah. What, how, how did we arrive at a bad, you know, whatever, credit line <laughs> approval because you happen to the be- The model a, decided. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you can't have a black box. Yeah. You need to have explainability and then, you know, we were calling it data supply chain. We sell that in software supply chain. Not just lineage, but like, where did this come from? Yeah. Who produced this? The source, the individual item that was able to trickle down into a model output, like, that's, that's a long tail for, for AI adoption. Alex, great to see you. Thanks for coming on this special inaugural AI Silicon Valley event. Great to have you. Event. Thanks Thank for you guys on. for having right. me. Like okay, this is the Silicon Valley studio for theCUBE in Palo Alto. I'm Sean with Dave Vellante. Silicon Valley AI leaders are here. We'll be right back after this short break. <laughs>